Okay, audio lecture on totalitarianism after World War I. Key concept. Key concept. Key concept. Okay, so first of all, folks, we're going to talk about the definition of totalitarianism. Um, I'm going to go over some of this in class as well. Um, but I wanted to make sure that um, we covered the basics of totalitarianism and in class we're going to talk about those as well as um, how totalitarianism of the left wing politically and the right wing politically, how they compare and contrast. So I'm going to cover it briefly here but we'll cover it in more detail in class as well. Okay, so totalitarianism first of all versus conservative authoritarianism a contrast what is the difference between you know traditional conservative authoritarianism and totalitarianism conservative authoritarianism was the traditional form of anti-democratic government in Europe aka absolutism which we've been discussing since you know the 17th century uh, examples, of course, were Louis XIV, Peter the Great, Frederick the Great in Prussia, uh, Catherine the Great, Clemens von Metternich. All of those are examples that we've covered in this class. Uh, these regimes sought to prevent major changes from undermining the existing social order. Most people, however, were able to go about their normal everyday lives uh, and they were more concerned with local affairs than, uh, that directly affected them rather than national affairs. So absolute monarchs did not try to get themselves involved in the everyday lives of the everyday people. Popular participation in government was forbidden or severely limited. This is in stark contrast to the 20th century totalitarian governing forces where people were expected to participate in the system actively and support the regime. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You must toe the line. You must participate um, in accordance with the will of the dictator. That is the way 20th century totalitarianism is different. Stalin's five-year plans in Russia will be an example of this that we'll go over in this lecture as well as the Hitler Youth in Germany. Um, so back to authoritarianism. Um, it was limited in power and its objectives. Absolute monarchs usually sought the status quo. Uh, it lacked modern technology and communications and could not control many aspects of their subjects' lives. It usually limited demands to taxes, army recruitment, and passive acceptance of the regime. It'll be completely different with totalitarianism because they have the modern technology and communications. They can control the way their people think. Conservative authoritarianism or absolutism reemerged a bit after World War I, especially in less developed Eastern Europe and Spain and Portugal. Only Czechoslovakia remained democratic. The Great Depression in the 1930s ended various levels of democracy in Austria, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, Estonia, and Latvia. So, totalitarianism in comparison. New technology made total control possible, like radio, automobile, telephone. Governments could wiretap telephone lines to spy on suspected dissenters. Uh, improved communication enabled regimes to coordinate quickly with local officials to get rid of any and all opposition quickly. Radio was a new tool also used for propaganda purposes in addition to the traditional printed media. Automobiles and trucks gave regimes increased mobility so they were able to move quickly and take territories. The tools of totalitarianism, whether of the left wing on the political spectrum or the right wing on the political spectrum, were the same. They used censorship, indoctrination, and terror. Virtually no freedom of the press existed 
in either left or right wing totalitarianism. The press became an organ of the government. Education was geared to creating loyal citizens of the state while demonizing potential enemies. The failure to support or comply with government policy often resulted in physical punishment, imprisonment, or death. Again, this is the same no matter whether it's right-wing or left-wing totalitarianism. Again, I'll explain more specifics about that in class. Totalitarian regimes were either fascist, meaning right-wing, or communist, meaning left-wing. Communists in Russia or the Soviet Union. Fascist in Italy and Germany. Remember, communist meaning left-wing totalitarianism, fascist meaning right-wing totalitarianism. Here is a visual showing you a compare and contrast of right-wing totalitarianism, fascism, and left-wing totalitarianism, communism. We'll discuss this more specifically in class as well. Key concept. Now let's talk a little bit about the Soviet Union or the USSR specifically, left-wing totalitarian dictatorship. It all started, of course, with Vladimir Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution. His Marxist-Leninist philosophy. First of all, the theory of imperialism that he had. Imperialism is the highest form of capitalism, he argued, as the search for new markets and raw materials fed the bourgeois hunger for more profits. The conquered peoples were ruthlessly exploited. A new type of party is what he envisioned. A cadre of educated professional revolutionaries will serve in the development of political class consciousness and the guidance of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Remember, this is his, his group of professional revolutionaries that he argued would deliver the revolution to the people. Lenin's view stood in stark contrast to Marx, who did not envision a totalitarian dictatorship from above by an elite group, but rather from below by the workers themselves. Comrade Lenin cleanses the world of the scum. Long live the international proletarian revolution. More propaganda. So, like Marx, Lenin sought a worldwide communist movement. Uh, in 1919, the Comintern was created, which is the third communist international, meaning an international organization of communists. Uh, it was to serve as the preliminary step of the International Republic of Soviets towards the worldwide victory of communism. And Lenin was all involved in this. Um, then he initiated his war communism at home in the Soviet Union. We discussed this a little bit already. Um, its purpose was to win the Russian Civil War to help finance it by keeping Russia on a wartime footing. Um, it was also seen as the first mass communist society in world history. Socialization or nationalization of all means of production was done and central planning of the economy was necessary. In reality, the Bolsheviks destroyed the economy with war communism. Mass starvation from crop failures resulted and a de decrease in industrial output. The secret police, known as the Cheka, liquidated about 250,000 opponents um, at the same time. So that just goes to show you that living in a totalitarian regime, resistance is futile. The Kronstadt Rebellion of 1921 was a test to the resolve of the communists in Russia. It was a mutiny by previously pro-Bolshevik sailors in March 1921 at the Kronstadt naval base, and it had to be crushed with machine gun fire from the Red Army. This was seen as a rebellion from within the Bolshevik party. So this goes to show you that 
anyone who can be seen as a threat, even from within the party itself, can be liquidated in a totalitarian regime. This is very common in totalitarian regimes, whether left wing or right wing. We'll see similar examples that happen uh, in um, Hitler's fascist Germany, where he liquidates within his own party. It was caused initially by the economic disaster of war communism and the social upheaval left from the Russian Civil War. It became a major cause for Lenin instituting a new economic plan, or the NEP, instead of maintaining war communism. The new economic plan, or policy, uh, that is initiated starting in 1921 until 1928. It sought to eliminate the harshest aspects of war communism to try to alleviate the economic troubles that it caused. It was Lenin's response to peasant revolts, the military mutiny that we saw at the Kronstadt Rebellion, and to economic ruin. This goes to show you that totalitarian dictators have to um, change their course if they wish to maintain their power base sometimes. And whatever is the will of the dictator has to be the will of the people as well. So what the NEP did was it allowed for some capitalist measures to be in place. Lenin saw it as a necessary step backwards before they could move forwards with communism. The government would not seize surplus grain from the peasants. Instead, those peasants could sell that surplus grain on the open market. So they were still required to produce a certain amount that would be given over to the Communist Party, the government, that would then be redistributed to those workers in the cities. But they would be able to keep a, any um, surplus from that, from that um, quota that they had to produce for themselves to sell on an open market. Small manufacturers were also allowed to run their own businesses. However, the government was still in control of heavy industry, banks, and railroads. As a result of the NEP that allowed at least a little tiny bit of capitalism, so of course this is not true, cap true communism, so again showing you how Lenin deviated from Marx, um, but as a result of this the Russian economy did start to improve. Industry and agricultural output were back to pre-World War I levels by the time we get to around 1924-1925, workers enjoyed shorter hours and better conditions, and the temporary relaxation of terror and censorship also occurred. What about women? The Russian Revolution immediately proclaimed complete equality of rights for women. In the 1920s, divorce and abortion were made easily available, which is not always a great thing, obviously. Women were urged by the state to work outside the home and liberate themselves sexually from what they normally had to do according to their sex. Many women worked as professionals and in universities as a result. Women, however, were still expected to do household chores during their non-work hours, as Soviet men considered the home and children women's responsibility. Men continued to monopolize the best jobs as well. Rapid change and economic hardship will eventually lead to many broken families in the Soviet Union. So instead of uplifting women, what it mostly did was destroy families. Now, Lenin's impact on Soviet society. Quote, Russia was renamed the Soviet Union in 1922, or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR. The old social structure was completely abolished. Titles for the nobility were completely eliminated. No classes existed anymore except for the communist elite party. The loss of influence for the Greek Orthodox Church was also seen. The church became nationalized as well. Most of the churches would eventually be 
become museums to socialism rather than uh, their them being allowed to continue to worship. Uh, women did gain equality, at least in theory. The Russians had a greater expectation of freedom than they had during the Tsar's regime, although expectations were later crushed when Stalin came to power. What the October Revolution gave worker and peasant women, another propaganda poster about the beauty of communism. Now, Lenin dies in 1924, and a power struggle will ensue. Lenin had been um, the subject of assassination attempts during the Russian Civil War, and as a matter of fact, a bullet actually was lodged in his brain after one of those assassination attempts. It did not kill him, but it will eventually cause strokes, that he will have strokes, that, and eventually one of them will end his life in 1924, one of those strokes. Lenin, of course, left no successor because totalitarian regimes are based on basically the cult of personality, the will of the dictator. Joseph Stalin was more of a realist and believed in what was called socialism in one country. Before it could be spread to the world, it needed to be perfected in Russia. And he was not a fan of the NEP, which he saw as too capitalistic. Many thought that Leon Trotsky should be Lenin's successor, since he was his right-hand man for so many years. But it will result in a power struggle between Stalin and Trotsky. First, this, according to Stalin, Russia had to be strong internally and should defer efforts for an international communist revolution until it had perfected it at home. He sought the establishment of a socialist economy without the aid of the West, a true socialist economy, meaning reversing the NEP. Now, like I said, Leon Trotsky was more the Marxist ideologue, like Lenin had originally been, uh, and believed in a permanent revolution, a continuation of a world communist revolution. Party leaders believed Trotsky was too idealistic by this point, however, and that Russia first had to survive. That will lead to Stalin gaining more support in the Politburo, and he will gain effective control of the Communist Party by 1927. He had total control over all of USSR by 1929. Trotsky as a result, was exiled by Stalin and eventually assassinated by Stalin's agents while he was living incognito in Mexico City in 1940. Stalin will send a message. He will have him hacked to death with an axe. The Soviet Union under Stalin. The entire Politburo from Lenin's time was eventually purged leaving Stalin in absolute control. Did not want to have anybody who may be seen as a threat. So interestingly enough, he cozied up to them long enough to get their support for him to be the leadership, but then he would eliminate them one by one so they didn't get any designs on challenging him. Stalin initiated a new kind of economic um, program for Russia called the five-year plans. There are actually two five-year plans. The revolution from above would be the first five-year plan and it marked the end of Lenin's NEP. The objectives increase industrial output by 250 percent, steel by 300 percent, and agriculture by 150 percent. Those are some serious objectives. 20% of peasants were scheduled to give up their private plots of land and join in on collective farms. Stalin said, quote, we are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or we shall go under. So even if it meant that many would lose their livelihood or lose their lives, 
It had to be done for the good of the state. The results steel will go up by 400 percent. The USSR became the second largest steel producer in Europe. Oil production was up 300 percent. Massive urbanization took place in Russia. 25 million people were moved into cities from the countryside. Yet the quality of the goods was substandard to what was being produced in the West and the standard of living did not rise for the Russian worker. Enemies of the five-year plan. The capitalists, the wealthy industrialists, etc. Collectivization was the greatest of all costs under the five-year plans. The collectivization of the farms. The purpose was to bring the peasantry under the absolute control of the communist state. Any of those peasants who had made a little bit of money under Lenin's NEP would now lose control over their livelihood completely. Machines were used in farm production to free up more people to be moved into the cities to work in the government run factories. The government took control over the production of all foodstuffs. Socialism was extended to the countryside as a result. This resulted in the consolidation of individual peasant farms into large state controlled enterprises. Here's a stamp that shows collectivization of the farms. Farmers were paid according to the amount of work that they did. A portion of their harvest was taken by the government. Eventually, the state was assured of grain for urban workers who were more important politically to Stalin than the peasants themselves. The collective farmers first had to meet grain quotas to send to the workers in the cities before feeding themselves in a great deal of starvation for many of them. The results. Farmers opposed it as it placed them in a bound situation, much like the Mears had been under Nicholas II. The Kulaks, who were the wealthiest of peasants, kind of like the gentry in England, offered the greatest resistance to collectivization because it totally diminished their livelihood. Stalin ordered party workers to, quote, liquidate them as a class if they didn't toe the line. Ten million peasants died due to collectivization. Seven million were forced into starvation in the U Ukraine. So of that ten million, seven million starved to death and the other three million were liquidated by Stalin's henchmen costly costly we will keep the kulaks from the collective farm away with the kulaks the results of famine in the ukraine due to collectivization if you look closely you will see that those are bodies stacked on top of each other dead livestock in the ukraine if you look at this here you can see that how many um Livestock were uh, um, around in 1928 versus 1935. Um, many of them will um, be slaughtered. Um, many of them will also starve to death due to collectivization. Agricultural output was no greater as a result of collectivization than it was in 1913 prior to World War I. By 1933, 60% of peasant families were on collective farms. By 1938, 93% were. What about the structure of the government? The Central Committee was the apex of Soviet power. About 70 people controlled everything in the Central Committee by the 1930s. The Politburo was about a dozen members and they dominated discussions of policy and personnel. The general secretary was the highest position of power. That 
office was created by Stalin, and of course, he was the general secretary. Stalin's propaganda campaign was in full force once he initiated his five-year plans. The purpose is sought to glorify work to the Soviet people and encourage worker productivity. Two collective work, the happy peasants going off to the collective farms. We know that this was not the reality by the other photographs that we've seen. Collective farm at work. Come comrade, join us on the collective farm. Toward a prosperous cultured life. Smiling faces. Technology was used for propaganda. Newspapers like Pravda, which means the truth, films, and radio broadcasts all emphasize socialist achievements and capitalist plots. Sergei Einstein was the quintessential patriotic filmmaker under Stalin. He was utilized by Stalin to help propagandize the five-year plan. Writers and artists were expected to glorify Stalin and the state. Their work was closely monitored. If they did not glorify Stalin and the state, they would be liquidated by Stalin. And this says, beloved Stalin, the happiness of the people. Religion was persecuted under Stalin. Stalin hoped to turn churches into museums of atheism. What about benefits for workers? Old age pensions, free medical services, free education and daycare centers for children were provided. Education, Stalin saw, was key to improving one's position. Specialized skills and technical education though, rather than um, traditional um, education. Many Russians saw themselves building the world's first socialist society while capitalism crumbled during the Great Depression. The USSR actually attracted many disillusioned Westerners to communism in the 1930s. Of course, they did not see the millions that Stalin was killing because, of course, he kept that closely under wraps. The Great Terror between 1934 and 38. This was first directed against peasants after 1929. The terror was used increasingly, however, um, on leading communists, powerful administrators, and ordinary people. Anybody that Stalin saw as a potential threat to what he was trying to do. The Great Terror ultimately resulted in about 8 million arrests. Show trials were used to eradicate enemies of the people, usually ex-party members. This is when he was cleaning house in the Communist Party. In the late 1930s, dozens of old Bolsheviks, those who had been Lenin's closest followers, were tried and executed. Stalin saw them as a potential threat to what he was trying to do. The Great Purges will follow. 40,000 army officers were expelled or liquidated during the Great Purges, and this later weakened the USSR at the dawn of World War II. Millions of citizens were killed or died in gulags, which are forced labor camps, or they simply disappeared. Again, none of this was advertised to the public. It was kept under wraps, and that's why those, quote, admirers of communism from the West had no idea what terrible things were happening in the USSR. The Soviet um, democide components and war rebellion killed 1917 to 1987. How many were killed in certain things? Wars killed 26% of people. Terror killed 10%. 5% were deported. 10% were killed by famine. And 49 were killed in the camps, the gulag camps. Key concept key concept. Okay, on to fascist Italy, a right-wing totalitarianism. Causes for the rise of fascism in Italy. 
In the early 20th century, Italy was a liberal state with civil rights and a constitutional monarchy. The Versailles Treaty of 1919, however, um, the Italian nationalists were very angry that Italy did not receive any Austrian or Ottoman territory that they had wanted. They thought they would get this. This was this Italia Irredenta that they argued that they should have when they joined the Allies in 1915. They also didn't get any of Germany's African colonies as promised. This caused a great deal of bitterness among the Italian people towards the Western victor. The Prime Minister, Vittorio Orlando, angrily left the Paris Peace Conference before it was completed. A depression in 1919 in Italy caused nationwide strikes and class tension. The wealthy classes feared a communist revolution. They feared a left-wing takeover, and they looked instead to a strong anti-communist leader. By 1921, revolutionary socialists, conservatives, and property owners were all opposed to liberal parliamentary government in Italy. Democracy was doomed. Fascism in Italy eventually was a combination of conservative authoritarianism and modern totalitarianism, although not as extreme as what we saw under Stalin's Russia or Hitler's Germany. Here's a chart of ideologies that you can take a look at be um, um, before you uh, have your test, showing you liberalism, moderates, conservatism at the top, with republicanism and democracy, and of course authoritarianism and totalitarianism down on the bottom. Benito Mussolini rises to power, il duce, meaning the leader. Although he was the editor of a socialist newspaper, he was, at heart, a nationalist, an Italian nationalist. He organized the fascist party. The emblem of the National Fascist Party is below, and he traced this symbol all the way back to ancient Rome. He combined socialism and nationalism, even though he will be right-wing totalitarian, they still had an element of socialism with them. Remember before what I said, both conservatives and liberals all become more socialist with the rise of mass politics. Totalitarianism is no different. They all have an element of socialism, just to different degrees. So some of the things that he was trying to, uh, trying to guarantee and promise was the territorial expansion of Italy, benefits for workers, and land reform for the peasants. The party was named after the fasces, the rods carried by Imperial Roman officials as symbols of power from back in the Roman Empire. And this is the flag of the National Fascist Party in Italy. Initially, Mussolini's party failed to prevail because of competition from the well-organized socialists. They initially started to run for office in the Italian parliament, but had a poor showing in the election. In 1920, Mussolini gained the support of the conservative and middle classes for his anti-socialist party rhetoric. He thus abandoned his socialist programs, showing you that totalitarian dictators always can change their mind. The black shirts, or the squadristi, were paramilitary forces that Mussolini used to attack communists, socialists, and other enemies of his fascist program. These were his, basically his stormtroopers. And later in Nazi Germany, we will see Hitler's brown shirts following this example. This significantly undermined the stability of the government. If Mussolini and the fascists did not like the way things were going politically, he would send in the black shirts to bully people, to bully other parties, and ultimately this will help him gain control. The black shirts, like I said, a paramilitary squad organized in Italy by dictator Benito Mussolini. 
starting in 1919. Now, how does he actually gain totalitarian power? It all begins with the March on Rome in October of 1922. Mussolini demanded the resignation of the existing government and his own appointment to be the head of the government by the King of Italy. A large group of fascists marched on Rome to threaten the king to accept Mussolini's demands or they would kill him. The government collapses and Mussolini receives the right to organize a new cabinet and a new government by the king. The king was just trying to save his own skin. The black shirts march on Rome. Here's a picture of it happening. October 22nd, 1922. King Victor Emmanuel III gave Mussolini dictatorial powers for one year to end the nation's social unrest. He will never get that power back from Mussolini. Here's the black shirts of 1934. Violence in fascist Italy, showing you how who was attacked and when. The corporate state, or the syndicalist corporate system, was the economic basis for Italian fascism. He's trying to resolve the financial crisis in Italy. Mussolini was said to have said, quote, everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. By 1928, all independent labor unions were organized into government-controlled syndicates. So this is why I said that, fat, that uh, sorry, totalitarianism of the left wing and the right wing, they look similar because they use similar tactics um, to each other, even though uh, on the political spectrum, they're on opposite ends ideologically. Again, this will be discussed in class. The system established organizations of workers and employers. It also outlawed strikes and walkouts. It created corporations which coordinated, coordinated activities between worker-employer syndicates. Authority came from the top, unlike socialist corporate states where workers made decisions. So Mussolini was able to create a dictatorship a right-wing totalitarian dictatorship. The right to vote was severely limited. All candidates for the Italian parliament were selected by the fascist party, therefore outlawing all other parties. The government ultimately ruled by decree and the parliament that still continued to meet ultimately rubber stamped everything that Mussolini wanted done. Dedicated fascists were put in control of schools as well. The government sought to regulate leisure time of the people in order to make sure that the economy would continue to grow. Fascist youth movement or the Bahia and labor unions were all strictly regulated by the government. The Opera Nacional Bahia consisted of Italian boys ages 8 to 14. This is like Mussolini's version of the Hitler Youth, the Mussolini Youth, if you will. The Dopo Lavoro, or after work, social activities for the working class were ones that were sanctioned by the government only. Italy never truly became a completely totalitarian regime, right-wing totalitarian regime, like we will see in Nazi Germany. However, Mussolini never became all-powerful, even though he tried. He failed in the attempt to fascize Italian society by controlling leisure time. That was not something that they were fond of. The old power structure of conservatives, military, and the church remained intact in fascist Italy, and they were constantly challenges to Mussolini's authority. Mussolini never attempted to purge the conservative classes, knowing that it would be dangerous. They were too firmly entrenched in Italian society. He instead propagandized and controlled labor, but left big business to regulate itself. 
no land reform occurred as a result. He did not establish a ruthless political state. Only 23 political prisoners were actually executed between 1926 and 1944. Racial laws were not passed in Italy until 1938, and the savage persecution of Jews did not occur until late into World War II, when Italy was under German Nazi control. How did women fare? Unlike Russia, Italy's social structure emphasized a traditional role for women. This also became the case in Nazi Germany. Divorce was abolished and women were told to stay home and procreate. To promote marriage, Mussolini decreed a special tax on bachelors in 1934. In other words, marry or it's going to cost you. By 1938, women were limited by law to a maximum of 10% of better paying jobs in industry and government. Accomplishments under Mussolini. Internal improvements were made, such as the electric electrification and road building that happened throughout Italy. More efficient government existed in the municipal or city levels. And he suppressed the mafia, which was especially strong in southern Italy and Sicily. The justice system was improved as a result, except for those who were considered enemies of the state. They would receive his own kind of justice. The Lateran Pact of 1929 resulted in reconciliation between the Italian state and the papacy. The Vatican was recognized as a tiny independent state and it received $92 million for seized church lands. This was the deal that Mussolini made with the Vatican in order to keep them from opposing any of his political moves. In return, Pope Pius XII recognized the legitimacy of the Italian state under Mussolini. And therefore, when terrible atrocities started to happen to the Jews and others, Pope Pius XII will turn a blind eye. Mussolini and the Pope after the signing of the Lateran Pact 1929. The fascist legacy. Italian democracy was destroyed. Terrorism became a state policy and the Pope did nothing to stop it because of the deal he had made with Mussolini. Poor industrial growth was due to militarism and colonialism. Disastrous wars resulted from the attempt to recapture imperialistic glories of ancient Rome. Here's a picture of Mussolini and Hitler together after they form the Axis Alliance. Key concept. Now let's talk about Nazi Germany. The roots of Nazism were extreme nationalism plus racism. That equals Nazism. Hyper-nationalism fed the impulse to conquer other nations. The alleged stab in the back, the Weimar Republic signing of the Versailles Treaty, fed the nation's frustration with the government in Germany, the Weimar government. Now, let's talk about the racist ideas that were part of the Nazi agenda. They believed in racial superiority of the Aryan race, also known as the Germanic peoples. They believed in the inferiority of Jews and Slavs. Now let's talk about the rise of Adolf Hitler. He became the leader of the National Socialist German Workers Party, or Nazi for short, in 1919. The Nazis started as a tiny group of only seven members that under Hitler grew dramatically within just a few years. The SA, or Brown Shirts, were the Nazi paramilitary group that terrorized political opponents on the streets of Germany. In effect, it was the private army of the Nazis who were very loyal to Hitler. 
Hitler in the brown shirts at the annual Nazi Nuremberg rally in 1927. Okay, so the Nazi rise to power, or Hitler's rise to power, really began in 1923 with the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. That basically just means the riot um, that started in a Munich Beer Hall. Uh, Hitler was trying to t overthrow the government in the state of Bavaria, Munich, which was the capital of that German state, uh, and he failed in his attempt to do that. And ultimately, ultimately, he was going to use that as a stepping stone to take over all of Germany. He failed in his attempt and ultimately was sentenced to a one-year jail term. The issue gave Hitler national attention, however, and ultimately his popularity will grow as a result of this. Hitler realized in the future he'd have to take control over Germany legally rather than through revolution. So he will set about doing that after he gets out of prison. Hitler ran away after the failure of the Beer Hall Putsch, but was arrested and jailed, as I said, for a year. While he's in prison, he writes his very famous autobiography, Mein Kampf, 1923. It will become the blueprint for Hitler's future plans for himself and for Germany. Mein Kampf means my struggle. In it, he illustrated his belief in Lebensraum, or living space. He believed that Germany should expand eastward, remove the Jews from their lands, and turn the Slavs into slave labor. Anti-Semitism was a big part of the Nazi agenda. Hitler and the Nazis blamed the Jews for Germany's political and economic problems. The leader dictator or Führer would have unlimited arbitrary power in his vision for Germany. Here is his book Mein Kampf. Key concept. The fall of the Weimar Republic was a result of the Great Depression. So while Hitler is writing this book and gaining more and more popularity um, for his views, trying to rescue what he says, rescue Germany from economic decline, the Weimar Republic is not doing well in dealing with the Great Depression. Unemployment reached 43% in Germany by the end of 1932. Economic chaos and political impotence played right into Hitler's hands. Hitler began promising German voters economic, political, and military salvation, and they were eating it up with a spoon. Hitler promised big business leaders that he would restore the economy by breaking Germany's strong labor movement and reducing workers' wages if necessary. Hitler assured top army leaders that the Nazis would reject the Versailles Treaty and rearm Germany, and that would help bring more people back to work. Rearming Germany, rearmament program. The Nazis also appealed to the German youth. 40% of the party was under the age of 30 in 1931. 67% were under the age of 40. In 1930, the Weimar Chancellor gained permission from President Hindenburg for emergency rule by decree. The struggle between the Social Democrats and the Communists in the Reichstag contributed to the breakdown of the Weimar government and resulted in the rise of the Nazis. The Nazis won the largest percentage of votes in the new elections for the Reichstag in 1933 though not a majority because of the multi-party system. They had a plurality, but not a majority. They demanded that Hitler pl play a leadership role in the government because they had that plurality. This poster is from 1932, the caption, enough, vote Hitler. Work and food, this poster says, 
It was used for the November 1932 Reichstag election. The Nazis viewed this as one of their most effective posters. They guaranteed work and food for those who voted for them. So Hitler was eventually allowed to become Chancellor on January 30, 1933, appointed by President Paul von Hindenburg because of the pressure that he had from the people to make Hitler the Chancellor. In March 1933, poster says, the text says, in the deepest need, Hindenburg chose Adolf Hitler for Reich Chancellor. You too should vote for list one. Key concept. So how does Hitler go from just becoming the Chancellor or head of the Reichstag to actually becoming a totalitarian, right-wing totalitarian dictator? And establishing the Third Reich. He quickly consolidated power, step by step. First of all, in 1933, there was a mysterious fire that broke out during the violent electoral campaign in 1933. This fire happened actually in the Reichstag building, which is like the capital building of the um, government. And this scared people. The incident was used by the Nazis and Hitler to crack down on the communists. Why? Well, because they blamed the fire on the communists. Because they uh, were able to rise to power instead of the communists, um, they blamed the fire on the communists. They said the communists were angry that they did not win the elections, that instead the Nazis won the plurality. It was probably Hitler who set the fire or had the fire set so he could eliminate the communists as a threat. And it worked. The SA stepped up its terrorism of political opponents as a result. The Reichstag fire, as it says here, was used by the Nazis to crack down on the Communist Party. The Communist Party in Germany will be outlawed. The leaders of the Communist Party will be rounded up by the SA or the stormtroopers of the Nazi Party and liquidated. Then probably the final straw that made Hitler a totalitarian dictator was the Enabling Act. Because of the Red Scare that was going on in Germany due to the Reichstag fire, the Enabling Act was pushed through the Reichstag in March of 1933. It gave Hitler absolute dictatorial power for four years to deal with the crisis. This power will never be given back. Only the Nazi party was a legal party with the Enabling Act. All other political parties were outlawed. Hitler also outlawed strikes and abolished independent labor unions as a result of the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act made him a totalitarian dictator. It gave him dictatorial power and it, and it said that he could pass laws without the approval of the Reichstag. So folks, what is the point of a Reichstag if he can pass laws without their approval? The answer is there is none. Publishers, universities, and writers were brought into line. Censorship of the press, democratic, socialist, and Jewish literature was all put on blacklists throughout Germany, and massive book burnings would be the result. Students and professors burned forbidden books in public squares. Modern art and architecture were prohibited, dubbed as, quote, degenerate art by the Nazis. Joseph Goebbels was the kind of head of the propaganda department for the Nazis. Um, and he visited the, the degenerate art exhibition of 1937. Nearly one million people saw the exhibit in six weeks because it was labeled degenerate art. Much of it would be destroyed after the show. The Nazis staged a massive exhibition of degenerate art in Munich in 1937. Rather awkwardly, it drew more visitors than the exhibit of approved art. This poster announces the exhibition. Here are the Nazi party book burnings. Those are books down there in a pile that's burning. 
art was considered to be one of the most important elements to strengthening the Third Reich and purifying the nation. Political aims and artistic expression became one under the Nazi party. The task of art in the Third Reich was to shape the population's attitudes by carrying political messages with stereotyped concepts and art forms. In other words, to indoctrinate the public. Here, Hitler gives a salute to those who had died for their state. Joseph Goebbels was the Minister of Propaganda who effectively glorified Hitler and the Nazi state through his propaganda. He hired a woman named Lenny Riefenstahl to film a documentary called Triumph of the Will. This was the documentary of the Nuremberg Rally of 1934, and it was used by the regime as propaganda to make Hitler look larger than life and to glorify the Nazi regime. I have placed a clip of Triumph on the Will in the module on Canvas for you. In June of 1934, we see how Hitler will liquidate anybody that he sees as opposition within his own party, within the Nazi party. Remember, this is the method of operation or the MO of many totalitarian dictators, whether left wing or right wing. Stalin purged the Communist Party. Hitler also purges the Nazi Party of anybody he sees as not towing the line with the Night of the Long Knives in June of 1934. Hitler was warned that the army and big business were now suspicious of his stormtroopers, the SA, and their tactics. To please conservatives, Hitler's elite personal guard, known as the SS, arrested and shot without trial about 1,000 SA leaders and other political enemies. So he used his personal guard, the SS, to arrest and shoot who had originally been members of the Nazi shock troops, the SA, purging his own party. The SS grew dramatically in influence as a result, and they became Hitler's private army and his new secret police. He put Heinrich Himmler, one of his most devoted um, henchmen in charge of the SS. The SS joined with the political police, known as the Gestapo, to expand its network of special courts and concentration camps for political prisoners. The Hitler Youth was also initiated. Nazis indoctrinated German youths with views of German racial superiority and Jews as the source of Germany's problems. Eventually, membership in the Hitler Youth became mandatory for all youth in Germany. They had no choice. And this is an example of how totalitarian regimes demanded participation by the masses, in contrast to the 17th century absolutism where regimes merely sought obedience. Children were encouraged to turn in their teachers or even their parents if they seemed disloyal to the Reich. The text of this 1940 poster reads, Youth serves the Fuhrer, all 10-year-olds into the Hitler Youth. Membership in the Hitler Youth had become mandatory in 1936. Here is a picture of Hitler Youth at a Nuremberg rally. Key concept. The persecution of the Jews as part of the Nazi agenda. By the end of 1934, most Jewish lawyers, doctors, professors, civil servants, and even musicians had lost their jobs and the right to practice their professions in Nazi Germany. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 were passed that deprived Jews of all rights of citizenship. In other words, they lost all of their civil rights completely. Marriage or even sex between Jews and other Germans was prohibited. Jews could not hire German women under the age of 45 as domestic workers either. 
and Jews were forbidden from displaying the Reich or national flag in their businesses. Other laws were also put in place. Jews could not use hospitals. They could not be educated past the age of 14. They were prohibited from using parks, libraries, and beaches. War memorials were to have Jewish names removed. By 1939, 50% of Germany's 500,000 Jews had emigrated. They had left Germany. Many were the cream of the crop, meaning they were the ones that were highly educated <clears throat> and they, many of them moved to the United States. However, that means that there's that other 50% that remained in Germany and they will be the targets of Hitler's final solution in the Holocaust, as well as Jews in other parts of Nazi-controlled Europe by that point. Huge immigration fees and confiscation of Jewish property helped the government to finance the economic recovery. Kristallnacht was the night of broken glass that happened in 1938. Hitler ordered an attack on Jewish communities in a speech that he gave using the assassination of a German diplomat in Paris by a young Jewish boy as the pretense. A well-organized wave of violence ensued destroying homes, synagogues, and businesses of Jewish citizens. Thousands of Jews were arrested and made to pay for the damage. Jewish businesses were damaged or destroyed during Kristallnacht. Here's a picture. Synagogues throughout Germany were destroyed during Kristallnacht. This 1940 poster advertises the worst of the Nazi anti-Semitic films, The Eternal Jew. The Jew, the inciter of war, the prolonger of war, this one says. Hitler in his own words, Nature is cruel, therefore we are also entitled to be cruel. When I send the flower of German youth into the steel hail of the next war, without feeling the slightest regret over the precious German blood that is being spilled, should I not also have the right to eliminate millions of an inferior race that multiplies like vermin. This is Adolf Hitler quoted in Hitler by Joachim Fest, Vintage Books Edition, 1974. This is his words, folks. Shows you how anti-Semitic he was. The Holocaust will be discussed more as we cover World War II, but in the Holocaust, six million European Jews were eventually killed during what was known as the Final Solution. Other victims of Nazi persecution included Slavs, Gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, Communists, Homosexuals, Mentally Handicapped, and Political Opponents. And this all totaled six million extra by 1945. So about 12 million total. Somewhere between 11 and 12 million. About five to six million Jews, about six million others. The T4 project, 200,000 handicapped and elderly people were murdered in 1939 in the name of maintaining Aryan purity. German economic recovery, however, did happen under the Nazi regime. The major reason for Hitler's soaring popularity was this. Hitler delivered on his economic promise of work and bread. A large public works program started to get Germany out of the depression. It included superhighways, or the Autobahn, being built, offices, gigantic sports stadiums, and public housing. This got people back to work and it made the economy thrive. Here's the real national product in the Great Depression of the different nations. The Autobahn built in Nazi Germany. Oddly enough, they didn't, there weren't a lot of cars on it because most people didn't have cars because they couldn't afford them. But later on, Hitler will sponsor the building of a new people's car or Volkswagen so they could afford to buy their cars. Yes, folks, the Volkswagen was founded in Nazi Germany. 
The Autobahn was built with transport of military vehicles in mind, however. That was the real point of it. So knowing that another war would be fought and they would need to be able to get the military vehicles from place to place across Europe, across Germany to get to other parts of Europe fairly quickly. This poster comes from the mid-1930s. The caption, Hitler is building, help him, buy German goods. The Winter Aid was the Nazi Party charity. Each year there was a drive to solicit donations to help the needy. Contributions were not entirely voluntary, however. The text translates as, no one shall go hungry, no one shall be cold. This poster from the mid-1930s, the caption, Germany is free, thanks to Hitler. The 1936 Olympics were held in Berlin, signaling Germany's legitimacy by the international community. In 1936, Germany began a rearmament and government spending began to focus on the military. This is when Hitler starts gearing up for the next world war three years before anybody else did <clears throat> because instead they were focused on their own internal problems at home and wanted to appease the dictator instead. The results of Nazi economic policies. Unemployment dropped from 6 million in January of 1933 to about 1 million in late 1936. That's a huge improvement in the economy. By 1938, a shortage of workers actually existed. Women took many jobs earlier denied by the anti-feminist Nazis as a result. By 1938, the standard of living for the average employed worker increased moderately as well. So the economy was sound under Hitler. Profits of business rose sharply. Nazi society, was there really a social revolution? The well-educated classes held on to most advantages they possessed prior to the rise of Hitler. Only a modest social leveling occurred. Because remember, this is a right-wing totalitarian dictatorship rather than a left-wing one, which basically levels all classes except for the Communist Party. This is different. This is right-wing. Like fascist Italy, Women viewed as how, were viewed as housewives and mothers primarily. Hitler employed, em, sorry, implored German women to make babies for the Reich. Them as soldiers in the coming war. Birth control information and abortions were forbidden for German women, although allowed for unwanted groups such as Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs. Women were denied most meaningful occupations outside of the home as well. Only in wartime were large numbers of women mobilized for work in offices and factories. Key concept. Authoritarian dictatorships in Central and Eastern Europe after World War I. Attempts at parliamentary democracy failed in every country in Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans, with the exception of the democratic Czechoslovakia. The collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the weakening of Russia due to the revolution led the region in transition. Ethnic tensions rose in several countries as a result. Nationalists often condemned the Versailles Treaty in its redrawing of the European map. The Great Depression further destabilized the economies of Eastern European countries, leading to a surge in authoritarianism. Hungary after World War I. Hungary. A communist revolution led by Béla Kun in 1919 ultimately failed in 1920. Hungary lost two-thirds of its territory and 60% of its pre-war population in the Treaty of Trianon in 1920. Between 1921 and 1931, Miklos Horthy led an authoritarian right-wing government in Hungary. 
1932, the Hungarian head of state appointed a fascist prime minister, but then staved off fascist attempts to overthrow the government. Poland. Poland gained independence in 1918 through the support of the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, who had included Poland's independence in his 14 points. Catholic Poland included millions of Ukrainians and Belarusians who were Orthodox Christians, one million Germans, mostly Protestant, and three million Jews. Joseph Pilsudski established a temporary dictatorship in 1918 in Poland to counter the ethnic, economic, and political tensions there. Pilsudski invaded Ukraine, hoping to extend Poland's influence eastward as a bulwark against the future Soviet expansion. The Soviets nearly won the war by nearly taking Warsaw before the Poles rallied to save their new country. The Treaty of Riga, 1921, established the Soviet-Polish border that lasted throughout the interwar period. Eastern Europe after the Treaty of Riga, 1921. Poland became the first state in Eastern Europe to establish a di dictatorship. A parliamentary multi-party system had emerged after 1920 with Pilsudski as the leader. The ineffectiveness of the multi-party system, which fell nearly twice per year on average, eventually led to Pilsudski overthrowing the parliamentary government in 1926. We have talked about the troublesome nature of multi-party systems in governments before. So this is just another example of that. Political parties remained in principle and freedom of the press remained intact. Pilsudski continued increasing the power of his military dictatorship after 1930 by arresting opponents and sanctioning an even more authoritarian constitution until his death in 1935, after which army officers continued his policies until Germany's invasion of Poland in 1939. Romania. As a result of the Treaty of Trianon, Romania gained much of Hungary's former territory. One third of Romania's population now contained Hungarians, Germans, Ukrainians, and Jews. These ethnic minorities were unhappy to be separated from their traditional homelands and did not feel as if they fit in their new home. Between 1918 and 1938, Romania was a liberal constitutional monarchy that had to defend itself against right-wing challenges. In 1938, King Carol II established a dictatorship as a way to defend against the rising fascist influence and fanatical Orthodox Christian insurrectionists who were strongly anti-Semitic in Romania. Eastern Europe after the Treaty of Trianon. Romania after the Treaty of Trianon. Yugoslavia. The country emerged as the largest of the, quote, successor states, end quote, created out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire after World War I. It eventually contained Serbia, Orthodox Christians, Croatia, Catholic Christians, Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, which were Muslim, Montenegro, Kosovo, also Muslim, and Macedonia, mostly Orthodox Christian. Map. From the outset, two competing views emerged. A, quote, greater Serb vision of Yugoslavia with Serbia as a dominant political player, 
and a Federalist structure where all nationalities and religions would play equal or proportional roles. Parliamentary democracy lasted until 1929 when King Alexander I, who reigned from 21 to 34, outlawed political parties and dissolved the parliament altogether. In 1934, the king was assassinated with the help of a right-wing Croatian party that demanded independence. Croatia gained autonomy, but Yugoslavia remained an authoritarian government with Serbia as the dominant state. Greece established a fascist dictatorship in 1938 with the blessing of the king. Austria struggled as a parliamentary system in the 1920s but became increasingly dominated by right-wing challenges after 1927. The Austrian parliament was dissolved in 1933 and an authoritarian state emerged. Fascism dominated politics thereafter and the Austrian Nazi party later facilitated Hitler's takeover of that area in 1938 with the Anschluss of Austria. This will be discussed in a later lecture.